Pessoal, vocês já conhecem o processo, né? Eu tenho que chamar a galera que tá lá no fundo. Então eu tenho que falar bem alto e quem tá aqui, estão avisados? Beleza? O cara já tá com fone de ouvido muito bem. É isso aí, beleza? Ok? Fechado? Boa tarde, Campos Pará! Oh! E aí, galera, quem tá gostando da Campus Party aqui? Aê! Quem não tá gostando, não levanta a mão, depois vem falar comigo que a gente vê o que tá acontecendo. Tá certo? É isso aí. Me diz uma coisa, quem tá acampando aqui? Ó a galera acampando, hein? Tá massa acampar, não? Quem tá aqui pela primeira vez? Ó a galera aqui pela primeira vez. Deixa eu, deixa eu descer. Posso descer com o microfone aqui, não? Posso descer, beleza? Beleza. E aí? Vou pegar você aqui. Primeira vez que está acampando aqui? Primeira vez que está vindo, primeira vez que está acampando. Você é de onde que você é? Sou de Timbó, Santa Catarina. Santa Catarina. E veio de pra cá de quê? De ônibus? Avião. Veio de avião. Ah, você tá dos caras folgados, meu. Tá certo? <risos> né? Tá gostando aí, não? Tô, tá gostando. É muita coisa boa para aprender. Tá bem bacana. É, tá. Muito massa, muito massa. E aí, quem que vem de mais longe aqui? Vamos ver. Pará, Pará. Oh, Pará já é um bom começo. Oi? Goiás, não. Pará já ganhou. Tá certo? Pará é mais longe. Vamos ver se tem mais longe que o Pará aqui, não. Oi? Ah, os caras de Rondônia sempre ganham, meu. Rondônia, Porto Velho. E você veio pra cá como? De ônibus. Veio de ônibus. Caraca, meu. Tá vendo o cara? Vem de Santa Catarina aí, meu. Assim, 10 minutos de avião e você veio quantos meses de ônibus? Três meses. Ou oh, três dias. <risos> três dias? Caraca, meu. Tá certo? O cara já chega aqui cansado a semana inteira, né? E aí, tá dormindo aqui, não? Tá dormindo aqui. E aí, desde, desde que você chegou, já tomou quantos banhos? Já... Acho que vai ser o primeiro hoje. Vai ser o primeiro hoje, tá certo? Três dias no ônibus e não sei quantos dias aqui na campus e o cara já tá... E aí, galera? É, quem aqui trabalha com desenvolvimento de software? É? é isso aí. Quem quer trabalhar com desenvolvimento de software? Ah, muito bem. Ó, essa palestra aqui vai ser fantástica. Ed, let me get one of your books, please. Essa palestra vai ser fantástica. O palestrante, cara, escreveu esse livro aqui, ó. O Segredo dos uh, Desenvolvedores Rockstar. Tá certo? Ah, boa, bem lembrado. Eu vi umas pessoas levantando. Deixa eu falar para vocês aqui o seguinte. É, a palestra será em inglês. Então, tem a galera do Radinho. Onde fica o Radinho? Não era ali no lado? Ah, aqui, ó. Você tem a galera do Radinho aqui atrás do palco, né? Sei lá, do meu lado direito, do lado esquerdo do palco para lá, né? Lado esquerdo do palco. Então, quem precisar do Radinho, por favor, dá um pulinho aí, beleza, meu? Como é que tá? Tudo jóia? Então, é o seguinte... O palestrante escreveu esse livro, Segredos dos Rockstar, dos desenvolvedores Rockstar, e ele entrevistou é, alguns, dos, alguns dos maiores desenvolvedores do planeta. É, e ele capturou o segredo desses caras, o que fizeram deles os maiores desenvolvedores do planeta. Então, se você quer ser um desenvolvedor, ou já é um desenvolvedor e quer crescer na carreira... Oi? O que, que é? Pode olhar o livro? Eu vou, vou, vou deixar para ele mostrar o livro depois. Mas, ó, é, o livro, inclusive, acho que ele trouxe alguns aqui para vender. Depois eu dou um toque aqui, qualquer história. Mas o livro é muito massa. Podemos ver aqui alguns, alguns, alguns caras que ele entrevistou aqui. Só para a gente ver aqui. É, obviamente, você sabe que o meu trabalho é enrolar, né, cara? Que a galera tem que pegar ali na, na fila, tá certo? Então, assim, eu, posso, eu vou, vou enrolar aqui, né? Olha lá. Deixa eu ver aqui, ó. Caraca, meu, os caras são é muito massa. Porra. É? é isso aí, deixar na curiosidade, né? Ele falou que vai falar do livro, não vou falar pra vocês, né, meu? Porra, sacanagem, né? All right. Uh, so, Ed, we're just giving them a time to get there. É... Então é isso aí. Deixa eu ver, quem que já é desenvolvedor aqui? Deixa eu pegar um da... Cara, me conta a história de terror, assim, cara. Aquele momento que você achou que não ia resolver o problema, que você ia ser demitido, que ia ser péssimo. Tem uma história dessa, não? Quando você termina de finalizar o código e você pensa que está tudo rodando liso, você testa, testa, não acha erro. Aí o primeiro usuário que vai testar dá aquele bug que a 
acaba com tudo aí já liga no seu ouvido e nossa, cara, é, é horrível, é horrível. É isso aí. Quem já passou uma história dessa assim? Certo? Né? Quem já derrubou o servidor da empresa aqui? Aí, ó, o cara derrubou o servidor da empresa. Oi? Já derrubou o servidor da empresa? Não, vou, pegar, vou pegar o cara levantando. Ah, então, já, vou, senta. Não, vai lá, vai lá. E aí, Diego, você já derrubou o que você fez? É, eu fui fazer um backup e acabei desconectando o cabo, errando as conexões de volta depois. O servidor caiu, levou duas horas para voltar. Tive que fazer voltar. Eu não consegui, teve que chamar o técnico que fez a instalação é, para poder voltar. Isso é o melhor, né, cara? A gente é mestre em fazer cagada e não saber resolver, não é isso? Tá certo? As nossas cagadas não é aquela que você tropeçou e, opa, ligou de volta, né? É aquela que não tem jeito de resolver, né? Agora, quem tem uma história feliz aí? Uma história que achou que ia ser o maior desastre do mundo e deu certo? Alguém tem uma história feliz aí? Não. Cara, ninguém tem história feliz, meu. Não existe história feliz. Tá certo? É isso aí. Não tem história feliz? Não, né? Então, beleza. É isso aí. A fila já está quase acabando lá. Galera, deixa eu dar uma dica para vocês aqui. É... O Ed Burns vai falar aqui dos, do, do, dos segredos que ele entrevistou vários desenvolvedores. É, a gente trouxe o Ed aqui é, como parte da iniciativa lá do palco da Liga, da Liga dos Desenvolvedores. É... E a gente tem um projeto chamado Code for Life. Né? Então, se você quiser, a gente tem uma, uma série de vídeos gratuitos para ajudar você a crescer na sua carreira. A gente fez a mesma coisa, entrevistou alguns dos maiores desenvolvedores do planeta para dar as dicas para você. Então, quem quiser, Code4.life. Né? Você vai lá, se inscreve, você começa a receber os vídeos. Code4.life. É... Oi? Grátis. Free. Tá certo? Mais legal do que grátis. É, quando a gente terminar aqui a campus, né, lá na, na, na lista do Code for Life, eu vou mandar um e-mail para vocês convidando vocês para fazer uma conversa de carreira. A gente tem um conjunto de coaches de carreira. Nessa conversa a gente vai te ajudar totalmente grátis, sem custo nenhum. Uma conversa de 45 minutos que a gente vai te ajudar a ter clareza na sua, no, na sua, no que você quer na sua carreira, nós vamos te ajudar a eliminar o principal problema que impede você crescer na carreira e juntos nós vamos fazer junto com você um plano para que o seu 2018 seja fantástico na sua carreira. Então, quem quiser, totalmente grátis, tá certo? É uma conversa de 45 minutos, a gente tem um conjunto aí de coaches que vão fazer isso, a galera que se voluntariou para ajudar o pessoal. Né? Então, quem quiser, code4.life, se inscreve lá e logo que acabar a campus, a gente vai mandar um e-mail convidando vocês. Beleza? É isso aí. Acabou lá, não? Ok. All right, Ed, we're almost there. Beleza, pessoal, olha só. Quando acabar a palestra do Ed, a gente tem um pouquinho de tempo e tem um magistral. Então, logo que acabar a palestra dele, o Ed vai ficar aqui do lado, o pessoal vai montar uma mesinha aqui para ele, onde ele vai, quem quiser, pode comprar o livro... E ele vai assinar o livro para quem quiser aqui do lado, tirar foto, qualquer coisa. Mas tem que ser ligeirinho, porque depois tem o magistral. Tá certo? Então, oi? Eu não sei, vou perguntar para ele. Tá certo? Eu acho que é 75 reais, eu acho. Mas eu vou... Ed? Não, não, ok. Não, 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 I didn't call you, Ed. Can I tell the price? Oh, yeah, seven. Ok, tá dizendo 70 reais. 7,0, 70 reais, ok? Beleza. Ok, pessoal. Então, sem mais delongas, é, queria chamar o Ed Burns, é um amigo meu, é, de bastante tempo. A gente trabalhou junto a, em várias iniciativas. É, eu estive recentemente na casa dele, é, lá em Orlando. A, é um cara fantástico, viajou o mundo, conheceu os maiores desenvolvedores do planeta e destilou os segredos desses caras né, para nos ajudar a crescer na sua, na, 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 você crescer na sua carreira. Então, Queria aí um grande O oh para Ed Burns. All right. O oh! oh, Campus Party. O oh! O oh! O oh! oh! All right, thank you Bruno. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. My name is Ed Burns. I'm very happy to be here at Campus Party. This is my first time and uh, I've been to Brazil before for the Global Code Developers Conference. Anyone know TDC? Very good stuff. 
Um, also, we're, they're going to be uh, having a campus party in the United States uh, very soon, and the, that's going to be great. I'm going to try to get into that. So who out there is interested in becoming a rock star programmer? All right. Who works with people who are programmers? Okay. So that's what this talk's going to be. This is a, a, a collection of interviews that I did with some of the best programmers I could find. Uh, not just Java over the years and some very recent as well. I interviewed a few people uh, in December for the, for the next version of the book, which is a, more of like a podcast. So let me get started. Uh, what I'd like to do with our time, 60 minutes, is uh, first tell you what my idea of a rock star programmer is, uh, go over what has come before. There's uh, some other books that have covered this topic. Uh, then some categories of secrets. What do I mean by secret? And uh, then, of course, the problem with categories. A lot of what I'm going to be saying here uh, is just, you know, other people's insights. I'm not really trying to bring my own uh, recipe and say, this is what you must do. I'm not a rock star programmer myself, but I talk to these people and try to understand what they do and how they become good. <clears throat> So for me, what is a rock star programmer? It's a totally subjective thing. It's, there's no objective criteria for what it is. Uh, but talking to lots of people over the years, I have come to realize that someone that has a good mix of all the skills, they're not just a specialist in one thing. Uh, they're not a jerk. They're someone, if you're hiring, you'd really work to hire them on your team. Or if you're a team member, there's someone who you would like to work really hard to join. So these are people that have a leadership quality that um, takes a personal responsibility for making everyone around them better, not just keeping it all to themselves. Someone who's good at sharing uh, can internalize the information, organize it, and share it. So this is uh, one of my favorite movies, uh, The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension. And the uh, star, Buckaroo Banzai, has a good mix of all the skills. He's a brain surgeon. Uh, a rock star, uh, a ninja, uh, a detective, and uh, he's also a, a test pilot. So he does all of these things, and that's kind of showing what you need to be to be a rock star programmer. Um, this guy here, Vala Afshar, uh, is a Salesforce uh, executive, I believe, and uh, he puts out some good tweets. If you want to follow him on Twitter, it's just Vala Afshar. Uh, I thought this was a great list of things uh, from December of last year. Uh, that kind of dis that displays this as well, uh, particularly sharing credit there, uh, number 11, staying teachable. Uh, that is a big challenge over the years. Is the more gray hair you get, the harder it is to stay teachable, and, but it's, you have to work on it. So the prior art, um, these are a couple good books, older books that uh, address this issue, and no one is the first to do anything. You know, uh, you have to recognize that. It's important to be like, oh, I've got a new idea, but then remember, ah, you know, it's, it's in some sense all been done before and not let that bother you. That's just how it is. We're here at the end of history. Uh, so Susan Lammers, uh, Programmers at Work, it's out of print, but it's a very good book. It, you know, talks to interviews, Bill Gates and Charles Simone and Dan Breslin and you know, all these titans of programming. And another one is Out of Their Minds, uh, which is, focuses on programmers there. So what do I mean by secret? It's not a secret, you know, a secret is something you don't share, and I'm telling you, oh, you have to share. So this title is a bit of a, uh, it's a title, right, for selling a book. But it's a character attribute, or it's a habit. It's something you do as a matter of your personal process. So in this uh, presentation, uh, in the book actually rather, let me get the book, I have a lot of different uh, categories for the different uh, secrets. So I'm, you know, I break it down by uh, software technology experts, software pedagogy experts. These are people who know how to teach software. Um, and then uh, software development experts, people who are like Andy Hunt, for example, one of the agile developer founders, uh, pragmatic programmers. Um, in this talk, since we only have an hour, I'm just going to break it into ancient and modern. So that's a category scheme, ancient and modern. The problem with uh, categories is, uh, well, it's, let's let 
James tell us what it is. James Gosling is the guy who's seen as the father of Java. And uh, he is, in my opinion, a big rock star programmer. Anyone know uh, Java or work with Java out there? Okay, then you probably know James. Can you put up the audio? Something like, you know, if you label me, you, you nullify me or something. <laughs> Not into labeling things. Okay. Um, if only because it, it, it you know, the, the labels become the thing that, that, that define the universe. Yeah. And for me, the really interesting stuff is the stuff that doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. The big piece of the sort of programming culture these days where their entire universe is the stuff that generates HTML pages. Mm -hmm. And the stuff that goes on to those HTML pages, you know, mm -hmm. pieces of JavaScript and all that, and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And, that, and it's like, guys, don't you realize you're like in like this tiny little corner of, of, of things. Mm -hmm. There is so much more cool software out there. Mm -hmm. So that's James' advice. Be wary of categorization. So when I wrote the book, the first edition of it, um, I was working on a thing called JSF, Java Server Faces. Has anyone heard of that? It's kind of an older web framework thing. But he was talking to me and saying, you know, there's more to programming than just HTML and JavaScript because that's what JSF does. So I had to be able to listen to that advice and I'm interviewing him for the book, but he's also I saying, talking it to me personally and I had to be able to hear that and not be like offended or like, oh, what do you mean? That's my main thing. You're telling me I have to do something different. Well, yes, you do. So uh, there's an, a measure of humility you have to have as well. So, you know, the problem with making a list of top 10 things uh, is all the people you have to leave off of it, for example. Now, this guy, Adrian Collier, he's one of the co-founders of Spring. Um, and he, anyone using Spring out there? Spring is a very popular Java enterprise framework. And uh, he is, um, has a different take on categories. I guess one of the things about our industry, and actually one of the things that attracted me to it, is um, it's always changing. There is just an enormous amount of new stuff flying past you all the time. You have to have some way to sort of systematize, tag, understand, file, make the sense of all that immense stream of data flying past you. Okay. And if, you, if you've got a way of, you know, even at the first crude level, pigeonholing what something is and putting it in a bucket, that's your very first crude cut, understanding what on earth is going on. So that's, that's one pretty important reason why you want to be able to categorize. So you have two different perspectives. Categories are Useless categories are useful. So a lot of the advice in the book is kind of take your own perspective on things. So I mentioned humility, the importance of humility. And James Gosling was uh, the, kind of held up as the father of Java for a long time. And he was put out there and put up on stage and promoting Java and everything. And I asked him, how did he feel about being pushed into that role? Well, various people have tried to do that. And anytime I've been Ask. I've said, no! Okay. Um, but it kind of subversively happens. Uh -huh. Could I get a little more volume? So how do you feel about being that way now? It's sort of a mixed bag. I mean, I'm, I'm more uncomfortable than anything else. And, you know, it still feels kind of weird when people recognize me in the street, in the damnedest places, and I have no clue who they are. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, when you meet somebody in the street, you know, and they know you, and you have no idea who they are. You know, right. I always go, gee, is this like some old friend from high school that I had to remember, uh -huh. or is this just like some completely random person? Right. It's often hard to tell. Right. Okay. So let's get into the, now that we've dispensed with the categories, let's get into the ancient secrets. These are things that have been true for forever, right? Having a good balance between humility and pride, being aware of your own ignorance, uh, the importance of collaboration, being a good collaborator, um, being a member of the invisible college. I'll tell you what that means. Uh, and then, of course, uh, luck. So the first, having pride tempered by humility. In the ancient world, uh, we had the story of Achilles, and uh, that's where the phrase pride goes before the fall. So he was, you know, the famous guy, and he came, came low. Uh, this is a really good quote that I think a lot of rock star programmers that I've met are, are aware of. 
Um, every person should have two pockets and one there should be a note that says, for my sake was the world created. And then the second that says, I am but dust and ashes. And you gotta have, that's why you have two pockets, balance between those two things. So let's talk to Rai Johnson. He's another guy who was the creator of the Spring Framework about the importance of having humility and pride at the same time. I've very seldom seen a highly successful software developer who didn't have a fair degree of ego. Okay. And I think it does seek to motivate. It, okay. it serves to motivate. The question is whether or not um, there's the insight, the uh, metacognition, that it's getting in the way. And I think it's absolutely vital that people can cope with being wrong and being admitting being wrong. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I have seen, you know, I mean, the majority of good developers I've seen, or outstanding developers, mm -hmm. did have, you know, probably bigger than average egos. Huh. Achieving outstanding things very often does involve feeling that you know better and acting on it. And in order to do that, you're going to have to ignore some of the advice that people are giving you too. They're going to, if you're thinking you, you have the right idea, in order to bring that to the world, there's going to be a lot of haters. So you have to be able to push through that too. Another one, the awareness of your own ignorance. I'm very fond of this one. Um, in the ancient world, uh, the oracle had made a claim that Socrates was the wisest man. And Socrates was thinking, well, why, how could this be? I, I know myself, I'm not that wise. So he went out and interviewed all of the wisest men he could find. And uh, he found in this story that none of them were aware of their own ignorance. So in that case, uh, in that sense, the oracle was right because he's the only one who was aware of his own ignorance. Which brings me to this very interesting uh, taxonomy of ignorance here. And it, it pertains to software development. <clears throat> it's called the five orders of ignorance. So zeroth order ignorance is lack of ignorance. It's, it's knowledge. So I know how to program in Java. I know what Java is good for. I know what it's not good for. I know when to use it. Um, I know how to use it well. First order ignorance is lack of knowledge. Well, there might be a problem out there that um, Java is not good for, I know that. And there, there's another language, maybe Go is a better choice. So I don't know Go, I can go learn it. Then I've reduced, reduced first order to zeroth order. Second order ignorance is lack of awareness. You don't know that you don't know something, um, but you do have a way to find out what the right thing is. So you don't know that you don't know, but you can find out that you don't know, that you don't know. Then uh, third order ignorance, and this is where all the fun software in the world is written, is you don't have that suitably efficient process. You don't know that you don't know, and you have no way to even discover that you don't know that you don't know something. And so when you're there, you're kind of just groping around in the dark, trying to find something to get down to second and then first and zero. Uh, and then the fourth order ignorance is ignorance of the orders of ignorance. So you don't have that now. That's all been removed. Being aware of your own ignorance is crucial to everyone. Mm -hmm. And that's not particular to, to software development. Mm -hmm. I don't care whether you're writer or you're, you know, flipping burgers in a McDonald's. Okay. You know, okay. You've got to be aware of your own ignorance. Okay. And not be ashamed by it. I mean, right. it's not like everybody knows everything. Right. Well, uh, being metacognitive, um, aware of your ignorance is one type of this kind of metacognition. Um, how much of the time uh, in your day-to-day -day job do you spend thinking about how you're doing, thinking about your thinking process. How almost not. Almost not. So you're mostly in the mode, in the flow state, kind of. Absolutely. Okay. So that's that's James. He can sit in his you know Java world and meditate and be in the zone. But a lot of us have to spend more time focusing on, hey, am I being productive now? Am I uh, losing my edge? Maybe it's time to do something else. Um, but we'll get more to that later. This is Jennifer Peepas. Uh, I met her when I spoke at a conference in Chicago. She's an educator. She does um, media teaching. And uh, I, I wanted to ask her about, you know, advice for students uh, when they're trying to get into the field. Um, how do they deal with the fact that they have so much ignorance because they're at the beginning of something? So you have to be able to not be afraid of that and being willing to learn, willing 
to share your own expertise as well. Let's see what she says. The interesting thing for me was like being in this really small focused group of, of grad students was that there were people that had incredible skills, like far ahead of me and mm -hmm. how they did what they did. Mm -hmm. But nobody in the class was like good at everything. Mm -hmm. It's really easy to feel unconfident when you see somebody like doing something that you don't know how to do. Mm -hmm. But then there were things that, like just realizing that, oh, wait, there are things that I know how to do that they don't know how to do. The things that they know how to do that I don't know how to do, I can learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the things that I know how to do that they don't know how to do, I can teach. Like working with people who are better than me at stuff raises my level, but don't under, like I shouldn't undersell myself because when we got this like screenwriting and stuff, there were people that really struggled with that. And I was like, oh, this is, I got this. Okay, so I mentioned the uh, metacognition, knowing when to step away from the keyboard. I think a lot of programmers, myself included, have an obsessive compulsive mentality particularly when it comes to feeling that you're almost there, you almost got this problem solved, just a little bit more. I mean, th this happens when you're doing sysadmin work, when you're doing debugging, when you're writing new code and, and testing it. Uh, so you have to sometimes know when to step away from the keyboard. I remember when I was at university, we were in third year, four of us doing a software engineering project, which was actually, um, writing an equivalent to VI that accommodated multiple windows. And we were about a day away from the turning the thing in and it just started crashing constantly. And we couldn't, didn't know where it was. And I mean, we were pretty desperate because I mean, the, the first process of the marking was automated. So we would have got zero. Um, for like a semester's work with four of us. So we spent a lot of time looking for it. Uh, couldn't find it. The, you know, and even myself and the other guy who, you know, was the second best of the, the group, we were pretty desperate. So eventually I went to the bar and had a few beers and then Matthew was kind of thinking, oh my God, you know, probably Rod's more likely to find it than anyone else in his it looks like he wants to get drunk. But, you know, I, it may have been just dumb luck, but, you know, I had a couple of beers, two or three beers, um, went back, and I found it within half an hour. Um, you know, I don't think alcohol is the way to do it, but I don't think we were going to get a solution without changing something. You know, there are better ways to think differently, uh, like go and have a workout, go and listen to some music. You know, you may not have the luxury. You know, you may be fixing a production problem that's costing you your company money. Right. You may not have that luxury. Right. If you do, try to step away from it. You can easily get into a mode where you're not productive. So there you go. Um, it's just important to know when you're losing your edge. Um, this is Nikhil Katari. He is um, one of the founders of Microsoft Silverlight, uh, which was a older technology before HTML5 came along. If you wanted to have super reactive um, applications like applets and flash kind of it's but as Microsoft version of that and uh, I wanted to talk to him about con questioning qu conventional wisdom uh, this it's a phrase conventional wisdom meaning something that's just oh it's this is how it's always done you should always do it this way and sometimes you think well is that the right thing questioning that I kind of put that in the bucket of uh, being critical uh, have to be able to question when your gut feeling tells you that this isn't like the right thing, mm -hmm. have to have that instead of intuition. I, mean, I think that's what separates a programs to write code as opposed to someone who programs to actually create a solution. So you could think about conventional wisdom as uh, kind of a, a, a very old fashioned design pattern, a very informal design pattern. And uh, I have a segment later with Linda Rising. She is one of the major players in the patterns community, and she talks about that. But now we're coming to collaboration. The, uh, the ancient examples there, Odysseus and his crew collaborate and get back home. Uh, but the problem is he's the only one that survives, so he's not really a good boss to work for. Uh, Aeneas and the survivors found the city of Rome. They collaborate to do that. So collaboration is important. Um, I asked James, you know, how do you uh, 
make things better when you find the collaboration isn't working. And he said, well, it's harder when you get older because you get more set in your ways. And again, you have to work on not doing that. Uh, Andy Hunt uh, does a lot of consulting for teams that are doing agile development. And I asked him, what do you do if you go into a, um, a job and you find the collaborators are not really uh, gelling, that the agile is not being agile? What do you do? Um, we get, I get them to talk. I mean, any time I've gone and consulted to a team where they've had, you know, those sorts of communication issues mm -hmm. in, in between themselves, um, the number one thing that seems to help is something like a scrum stand-up meeting, mm -hmm. where it, it's a daily meeting, it's very focused on the agenda, you, you answer your three questions and you get the hell out of there. It's not, you know, some lengthy uh, meeting or discussion or diatribe you don't problem solve. You don't discuss. It's just, you know, you answer the, the scrum three questions. Here's what I'm doing today. This is what I was doing yesterday. Here's what I plan to do tomorrow. You know, here's what's in my way. And the idea is whatever's in your way, the manager takes as his to-do list. And, you know, you just go pop, 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 around the room. And now everyone knows what everyone else is working on. You get a sense of everyone's pace, everyone's velocity, a really, really effective way just to get everybody, you know, playing on the same page. That, to me, is the number one way to sort of kickstart getting a team to communicate with each other is to make them do it. So uh, he told me a joke that kind of goes along with that. In New York City, there's a very famous performance venue called Carnegie Hall. And if you're a classical musician, uh, or any other kind of musician really, but you want, it's like the, the goal to reach, or get to play at Carnegie Hall. So New York has a lot of musicians and there was a guy who was trying to find Carnegie Hall and he asks another guy who's walking there through the city with a violin case and he asks him, excuse me, do you know how to get to Carnegie Hall? And the guy looked at him and said, practice, man, just practice. So you gotta just keep doing it. So this is one of the newer rock stars I talked to. This guy is Brian Cantrill. Uh, he's the CTO at Joyent, uh, which is a major uh, JavaScript player uh, who also helped develop uh, Node.js. Has anyone working with JavaScript and Node.js? Okay. So um, I asked him about the very quick rise to prominence of Node and how did he feel about that? I think growth gets um, overly fetishized. Mm -hmm. I think people will kind of Fantasize about growth. Can you bring it up? Growth has got a, there are a lot of problems that come with growth. And it, I think that if, if a community is growing, but its values become divergent, that growth can actually become very problematic. And we certainly saw this in Node. You've seen this in a lot of other communities as well. The communities end up growing so much so fast that they end up fracturing on those kind of value and fault lines. Um, so honestly, I've come to really treasure small communities. I'm a big small community fan. Um, I like small communities because they often self-select in by those values. And they, to me, they feel uh, more intimate and more, um, they're more interesting in, in, because you've got a kind of the, this foundation of shared values and there's just less infighting. And, you know, so there's this huge spectrum of community that's out there. Um, and, you know, I, I tend to find myself as I get older gravitating more towards the smaller ones mm -hmm. and uh, being a little less interested in growing communities purely for its own sake. Um, so in Brian's role as the CTO, he's having to do a lot of hiring. And uh, one of the challenges is, um, especially when you're growing, right, they were doing a lot of growth. Um, how do you mitigate the effects of making a bad hire? Because that's one of the most expensive things, uh, depending on labor regulations. Um, if you have someone that's not quite the right fit, uh, it's not easy always to dismiss them. Uh, so what do you deal with? How do you deal with that? Yeah, and it, you know, mishires are really expensive. Um, they're really tough, and you know, especially when you're in a high growth mode and you're hiring a lot of people, um, you're going to have mishires. And you know, everyone loves to say that we're we're going to hire hire fast and fire fast, and I have never found that to be true. I have found that I mean, you I guess you might have some cases. I've never had one of these where you hire someone who is so unequivocally poisonous that there is just zero doubt in anyone's mind that this person should not work there anymore. Um, 
what's much more common is something more nuanced where you have someone come in and who has strengths but also has weaknesses that maybe you didn't anticipate and those weaknesses begin to affect the people around them um and you know sometimes it's someone that comes in that you know seems like a really earnest technologist but all of a sudden starts thinking politically and those kinds of issues get really complicated and nuanced very quickly especially if you've got someone that's a you know well-meaning or hard-working individual they've got you know these traits that are positive but you also see these very significant traits that are that are really tough and i have always tried to be um very honest and direct in my assessment of people and be willing to have tough conversations you no know, i think anyone who is who is kind of peddling a simple uh, remediation for that? Um, I think is somewhat self delusional. I, you don't want to have a culture of of ending people's employment against their will, um, and yet sometimes that's what you have to do. I mean, so it, it's really really tough. Um, and I I don't know that I'm getting any better at it as I get older. I think it's it's just very very difficult. So there are certain companies that are out there that are known as like. Uh, kind of sweatshoppy type places and you it's a really high pressure environment and a lot of fast turnover so that's something you have to be aware of when you're looking for a job at a, at a company it's kind of a different thing in your when you're in the consulting world because if you have problems with if they don't like you they simply don't renew the contract so this is more for people that are doing uh, trying to look for steady employment jobs so the invisible college this is a term that came up uh, went to describe before the internet, long, long before the internet, back in the days of these guys, Toko Brahe, Johannes Kepler, uh, classical physicists, uh, they would share the knowledge uh, that they had by passing around annotations in books. So it really is, uh, this is the paper there. Um, I can give you the slides, or I think they're on SlideShare, um, that describes this in detail. But it's basically an infil unfilled third informal communications that are produced by communities of people who share an interest. It's basically your posse, your group of people that you keep with you as you progress through your career. So these are two of the people that are in my posse. I had the very good fortune of being um, at Uni University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign around the time when NCSA Mosaic was happening. And I got a chance to work on Mosaic, which was the first graphical web browser. And uh, I came to know these people here. This is Max Levchin. He's the co-founder of PayPal, and uh, Libor Mikulik, who is the co-founder of Slide, which is one of the companies that was acquired by Google. And I asked them about the Invisible College and how important it is to them. There's generally one or two developers that I think are really awesome, that I know personally. And when I have a very specific question about how to do something, I try to rephrase it as the most general question. And then I ask them, and they generally have an answer that's really powerful. More than likely, I am one of those people for someone else because I get those questions really frequently. And I think it's just enough of a filtering process where, like, the guy who's a CTO at Yelp, who was my chief architect at PayPal, Can you bring it up a little? Like, super awesome programmer, knows his stuff really well. I don't know if he reads up on a lot of stuff, but he definitely keeps tabs and stuff more than I do. So when I say, How do you do this? He's like, Well, here's how Ruby does it. I'm like, okay, well, that's not really about Ruby, it's about how to do a good pattern for web products. It's a distributed bullshit detector, though, because you've got yes. all the people you trust and uh, everyone is an expert in some area or is more interested in areas. There's in areas in which you're generally interested and you will keep up on, and then for all, but it's, you know, it doesn't have to be all of computing. And, and then it's yeah, all it's, the other stuff. it's impossible to keep tabs on all of computing. There's Mark. a famous quote from uh, John Van Leeuwen right before his death. He said that back when I was young, it was actually possible to know about half of known math, implying, of course, yeah. that he was one of the people who knew about half of known math. At this point, I don't even know if anyone understands 10%. Right. Even that, I think, is basically something that indicates increase of bandwidth, because people used to write each other letters to exchange math knowledge, and by the time John Neumann was old, it was actually electronic communication was possible. So just the overload of research and collaboration intimidates impossibility of knowing everything, therefore one is probably better suited to being an expert in a few fundamental yeah. things than just trying to keep tabs on everything. <clears throat> so and having a network. But the other thing is that there's really not that much for you on a year-to-year -year basis. Oh, yeah. So the better your, your bullshit filter or your distributed bullshit filter is, the less you're really going to have to go out of your way. I don't think I've learned anything since school. Oh, well, 
relationships that you build in Bullshit Detector are people that you've sweated out some late night hours yeah. like hacking, and then you sort of trust them because you have seen how their brain works and it's sufficiently easy for you to model like what they would think is good. So the, you can build your invisible college by coming to events here like Campus Party, where you know you come here and you build stuff and stay in touch with the people as you go down the road. <clears throat> Okay, let's talk about luck. Uh, this guy here is another one of my rock stars. He's Kosuke Kawaguchi. He is the guy who uh, sort of brought continuous integration to the big time. He wrote uh, Hudson. Anyone use continuous integration frameworks of any kind? Circle CI, Travis CI, Hudson. It's a really important thing if you're doing uh, enterprise software development. Uh, lots of books out there on it. So learn continuous integration. It ties in with automated testing and test-driven development. It's very important. <clears throat> so Kosuke just built Hudson kind of as a side project. And a lot of the developers I talk to have these little side projects that they're doing all the time in addition to their regular day job. And I found that that's one of the rock star skills is being always having something going on the side. Uh, Dave Thomas is uh, one of the pioneers of object-oriented software development. And I asked him uh, about luck and how, um, how is important is luck in your career? always essential. Uh -huh. um, I think um, by my, my nature, I think with, with regard to technology, you have to be a wildly optimistic downside planner. What does that mean? It means that um, you can't bet that the technology is going to take off, is, is going to work, going to sell, going to commercialize okay. uh, in the short term. So this basically says that you have to be, you have to tack towards your course. You can't go and get a big injection of VC money and say, okay, we're going to hit the market in three years. Uh -huh. Okay, that's it for the ancient secrets. Now the modern secrets. These are things that are, you know, new and, you know, mastery of tools, being an optimizer and a customizer. The all about software, how to write it, fix it, maintain it, um, discerning trends. Uh, this is where the Invisible College helps as well because there's so many trends out there. How do you know which ones are going to be big and which ones are not? Uh, riding the hamster wheel of progress, knowing when it's time to change jobs, and having a non-IT plan B. Um, in today's world, it's very difficult and rare to find someone who's able to keep doing the same central career for their whole working life. So you probably want to have other things in mind to do that are completely un different from software. Uh, to um, Adrian there, uh, Chris Wilson is another part of my um, invisible posse from college who left University of Illinois and went on to Microsoft. He was the lead architect for Internet Explorer for a good seven years or so. Now he's at Google. Um, and I asked him about the importance of being a master of tools. You need to know your tools really well. At the same time, it doesn't mean you need to know how to use every single tool perfectly. It's more, uh, I think about it uh, uh, in terms of like being a mechanic or working on your house. Mm -hmm. You need to have a tool that's the right tool for the job. Mm -hmm. um, so if you are really heavily into debugging, you need to absolutely understand how to do, you know, use your debugging tools extremely deeply and broadly. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was a very popular podcast in the Java uh, heyday uh, called the Java Posse. And uh, this is a bunch of people that I work with at, at Sun, uh, some of it on JSF. And uh, I asked them about this continual optimization thing. What, why, why do programmers have to live like that? I think a good sign of a developer is someone who's always trying to optimize. And I, okay. and I discovered this in myself. Like in traffic, no one I know thinks the same way about, well, okay, Traffic light pattern is going to be so and so and so. So I'm going to go this way when I'm coming in this direction. I'm, you know what I mean? I have in my whole neighborhood mapped out in my head what the best path you have to make the right <laughs> turn here in front of the. Yeah. Why should I care really about a minute here, a minute there? It's I think it's, bring just, it up a little? it's just a mindset. I think always thinking of continual optimization. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we saw Brian earlier. Uh, he talked about a firing. Let's see what he looks for in hiring. Yeah, and I think pure technical chops in many regards matters the least. Um, I think that um, disposition, work ethic, 
um, ability to work in a team, um, hu humility, uh, the ability to, to understand complicated systems is in some regards more important than the overconfidence to change them hastily. People get surprised by our interview process because I'm not really actually interested in asking you how to balance a red black tree. In order to succeed, you need to have the ability to, more than anything, you've got to have the ability to grind. You've got to have the ability to be persistent when you are just getting punched in the face metaphorically. I really am interviewing more for intrinsic motivation for the problems that we have. So you have to have enough technical chops to have an appreciation for, for what you don't know, I think is the most important thing. Okay, uh, another great skill, being aware of the software safety net. I mentioned continuous integration, mastery of version control. Uh, who here is using anything other than Git for version control at this point? Some people, okay. Would you rather be using Git? Yeah, so um, I think that's, uh, it used to be, there was a few different choices here, but Git has kind of changed the game and that's the main player nowadays. Comprehensive unit tests, uh, continuous integration, it's something you really gotta know uh, as a rock star programmer skill. I talked about patterns, right? Uh, conventional wisdom is a design pattern. Well, the ability to recognize a pattern when it comes along uh, and hits you in the face, and then the ability to describe that in a way that it's reusable, you have to also encapsulate the context. So let's see what Linda has to say about that. Context right. is, is what we say in, the, in patterns lingo, mm -hmm. is there's a context, and that's a difficult part of the pattern to write because you can have a great idea. Mm -hmm. And yes, it might have worked for you, but you might not really understand the real context of your own pattern because you've only seen it in the context that you know. Right. In fact, novice pattern writers suffer from contexts that are not focused. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have to have it reviewed by a lot of different people so that's, that's important, that's the, the, the context is how you, the right situation to use the tool. The pattern itself is the tool, but the context is when is the right tool for the job. Um, another one is, uh, this ties in with tools, is where does the productivity come from? Uh, we've seen a lot of increases in uh, productivity in programmers over the years. For example, I just started learning the Go programming language myself. And uh, midway through the book, you know, they have examples at the end of every chapter. And one of the examples in the chapter was, write a web server that uh, pulls GitHub for issues and then sorts them in a list and displays it uh, in, in the UI. And with the fact that you could have a simple example that does that much functionality just shows the tools have advanced because you know, 10 years ago, doing that much would take a huge amount of software. And now it's all built into a single platform. I think that's one of the big unwritten stories of the last 10 years is in writing software is the just same product, uh, productivity revolution. It's look, a team 10 years ago and now can be cranked out by a person or two. Rather. To what do you attribute this big boost? I think it's open source and also the new, more, the new languages, the whole host of so Python, Ruby, okay. uh, to some extent, some of the other ones. Obviously, you know, there's the whole need to bring it up a little. Story. But just you know, high level, high level languages and open source software mm -hmm. to run it on. So, um, open source software is something that I think that people in Brazil get really very well. They understand it. It's it's become super super popular here, maybe more so than a lot of other countries in the West. So that speaks well for. Uh, Productivity here, and this is what I mentioned about the, uh, the Go programming language. Um, the importance of spotting trends. Uh, I'll skip through this one because we're getting short on time, but I interviewed uh, this uh, Dave Thomas in 2008, and I asked him to give me a, a, a perspective on when cloud computing would be you know, mainstream and super popular, and he said at most 10 years, and, and that is indeed what we've got. So, which brings me to uh, the cloud. This gentleman here is Brendan Burns, no relation to me. Uh, he is one of the co-founders of the Kubernetes project. He now works at Microsoft uh, and also is developing Kubernetes uh, for running on Azure. Has anyone worked with Kubernetes at all? 
Okay, if you're doing stuff in the cloud, uh, I definitely recommend you learn this. It's, it's like the new application server for the entire cloud. And uh, it's a very important skill if you're gonna be doing any cloud development to know how to work with this. It's container orchestration. So um, it lets you use Docker or Rocket and spin up thousands of containers and shut them down and make them respond to load and all about having them, uh, these containers know when the right time is and reporting the metrics on how their health is and it's, it's very important. So do look at that. Um, I mean, I think you can extend this to a degree to the container ecosystem in general. And I okay. think it's because, I think it's because we've seen uh, the cloud take off in significant ways. Um, and yet I don't think that the tools for managing and deploying applications kept pace with the, um, the flexibility and power that cloud was offering. Um, mm -hmm. And so people were sort of overextended um, with some of the more traditional DevOps tools. Um, and so containers uh, and then Kubernetes really exploded in popularity because they fit, uh, they, they address some pain points that, that people had. And I think one of the other reasons is that they fit pain points that everyone has, mm -hmm. from IT administrators to developers to CTOs, they, they, they just hit all of these different pain points. Um, and so it was one of those rare moments where I think everyone was aligned in, in, and got a win out of, out of this, right? Um, and so I think when that happens, you see rapid adoption. Um, I would say with Kubernetes in particular, um, we put a tremendous amount of effort into building a really open, welcoming uh, community and a, a community that was that, that really tried to embrace everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a ton of effort put into that early on um, and, and, and a really a big tent ecosystem. Um, I think that has also been one of the reasons it's, it's been successful is because we really approached it with a humble um, approach and, uh, and an open uh, approach to how you build uh, one of these communities. Okay. Uh, spotting trends. This is kind of a fun one. And I asked Andy Hunt uh, where he thinks um, some of the big trends that are coming in software will be. So here's what he said. Here's my thought on that. And I have no idea if this is actually going to work this way or not. But it strikes me that there is a, a real aspect of the cobbler's children having no shoes here. Um, if you look at any of our popular computer languages today, Gutenberg could print, <laughs> you know, virtually any computer program that in use, any computer language program in use today could be. I mean, it's that basic, that simple. And it occurs to me, in a lot of environments, given the richness of what we're trying to express, that that's a pretty poor model. Mm -hmm. It strikes me that there's there's an awful lot of opportunity there for a far richer expression of programming constructs, you know, and I'm not talking necessarily just about graphical programming or, you know, uh, boxes and lines and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, but, you know, something more along the lines of, of interacting in, say, Second Life or, mm -hmm. you know, some, some very rich virtual uh, environment like that um, uh, for a couple of reasons. You know, the fact that, you know, writing programs in black and white text seems pretty limiting, bandwidth-wise. That's, that's a waste of bandwidth. So this ties in with uh, what we see with Kubernetes. And I was wondering, you know, the, we're having things that are more automated. You've got continuous integration. You have cloud environments. Um, could that cause computer science to be a less viable career choice? Uh, because, you know, there's, if, you could, if each programmer can do much more, do the work of 10 programmers, then what happens to the other nine programmers, right? So I've asked Brendan about this, and he said, well, I, I don't really see it that way. So here's what he uh, says. I don't think that's ever going to happen. I, I mean, I think, the history of, I think the history of computing is that every time you build an abstraction layer, right. people simply build more applications okay. and, and build more interesting applications. Um, and so you could say that you know, the development of, of web technologies and JavaScript and things like that mm -hmm. that enabled a whole bunch of people to become developers. Um, I don't think anybody would argue that that somehow, uh, by becoming easier, reduced the number of developers we had in the world. In fact, it actually magnified it. Um, okay. So I would flip it around and actually say, I think that the real challenge and the real 
opportunity the cloud presents for business is uh, the opportunity to build better systems mm -hmm. uh, with the people who they have, right? I think that with Kubernetes, there's, you're, you're doing things like automatic health checks that you don't have to teach someone. I guess another way of saying this is you don't have to teach someone that they need to put a wrapper around their application to keep it alive if it happens to crash with mm -hmm. Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. Kubernetes just does that for you, right? right? Uh, there's all of this automation. Maybe another analogy would be that I use often is, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I had a remote control plane mm -hmm. and that remote control plane flew for a grand total of about 10 seconds before I flew it into the ground mm -hmm. where it died, right? right? And, and my children now have a quadcopter drone that they fly from iPad around the house. Right. right, and the reason that that's possible is because there's automation. Right. There's computers that are assisting people to get their jobs done. Um, I don't think that we've lost anything. In fact, I would argue that we've gained a lot via that automation, um, it, because my people can focus on the interesting parts of the job, not on the nuts and bolts of how do I reliably deploy a new service into my environment. Right. So we'll see. I, I think there's going to be a mix of things, though. Um, so getting short here on time, let me skip through this. Okay, uh, how far can you progress just being a really good programmer? This is coming near the end here. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, if you're, if you're a rock star programmer and that's all you do, how far can you get? Here's what uh, Adrian said. It was always a great tension and still is. I remember inside IBM and it, you see it over the place, it's kind of like, how far can you just being a really good program. Could you program. turn up a little? Um, and that's always one of these classic questions. Um, and for a few very exceptional individuals, but probably as a percentage an incredibly tiny one, simply being an outstanding programmer will get you an incredibly long way. But for most people, that's actually not true. Mm -hmm. um, certainly for me, you know, beyond just that individual being a great programmer, what really matters at the next level is can that person actually make a really great team? Because an individual on their own is, you know, only so good. So kind of, which means that you start thinking about things like their communication skills and all the rest of it come into play and actually are very important. Um, as you progress through the ranks, I really think if you, in any company of any size, to understand and have an appreciation of at least the interplay between business and technology mm -hmm. and how technology decisions impact your options in business and vice versa. Mm -hmm. That's a really important space to have a grasp on. And in general, people who can understand that about tend to progress faster and further than people who can't or are just not interested. Okay, uh, this come and take a tangent every now and this is a good one to finish up on. Um, this ties into the other the plan B thing. So let's, I asked Linda, you know, what do you do when you realize you've hit a wall and you need to make a switch in your career? 10 years ago, when I was working in design patterns, I got pulled away in a different direction. It was a totally different area for me. I was still writing about software and still concerned with software, but it was not technical. And I thought I would do the patterns that I was interested in and then I would leave it. I would go back to being purely technical. Mm -hmm. And what it brought to the table for me was a deeper understanding of what software was all about. Mm -hmm. It provided almost a lens for looking back at all of the technical things that I thought were the most important in software mm -hmm. development. It enabled me to stay relevant in a very different way. Not by keeping up with all the latest technical things, but by seeing everything in a different way. Oh, let me go back. Ah, there we go. So this is our conclusion. This is a summary of the secrets there. Um, I have the copies of the book, or you can just talk to me afterwards. I'll be here for the whole week. And uh, I really appreciate your time, and I hope you have a great rest of your campus party. And I'll see you around. Thanks. If you have any questions, just come talk to me over on the side because I like talking to people in person. And I'm going to be on the developer stage with Bruno 
uh, a lot during the week too. All right. 